community activity. The more people come, more preaching can go on. The net result being that Krishna consciousness will further increase and more souls will be saved from the clutches of material existence. Prabhupada confronted a variety of topics in today's mail, from orchestrating the worldwide production and distribution of his books through the efforts of enthusiastic followers to solving the personal problems of a disciple struggling with Maya to encouraging the newly interested a university teacher in Copenhagen and a distressed young man in Australia. Everyone received his close personal guidance <coughs> and attention. Srila Prabhupada. Shall I just go at normal speed? I will speak a little slower, is it? I'll try to speak. Okay. All right. So this morning we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, reading from Canto number 5, chapter number 19, entitled A Description of the Island of Jambudweep. And today we're reading from the very first verse of that chapter. So first I'll just read the uh, summary of the chapter. I don't know if you, if you can get that. The summary of the chapter. This chapter describes the glories of Bharat Varsh and it also describes how Lord Ramachandra is being worshipped in the tract of land known as Kimpurusha Varsh. The inhabitants of Kimpurusha Varsh are fortunate because they worship Lord Ramachandra with his faithful servant Hanuman. Lord Ramachandra exemplifies an incarnation of Godhead who descends for the mission of Paritranaya Sadhunam Vinashaya Chaduskritam, protecting the devotees and destroying the miscreants. Lord Ramachandra exhibits the actual purpose of an incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and the devotees take the opportunity to offer loving transcendental service to Him. One should surrender fully to the Lord forgetting one's so-called material happiness, opulence and education, which are not at all useful for pleasing the Lord. The Lord is pleased only by the process of surrender unto Him. When Devarishi Narad descended to instruct Sarvani Muni, he described the opulence of Bharat Varish India. Sarvani Manu and the inhabitants of Bharat Varish engage in devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the origin of creation, maintenance and annihilation, and who is always worshipped by self-realized souls. In the planet known as Bharat Varish, there are many rivers and mountains as there are in other tracts of land. Yet Bharat Varish has special significance because in this tract of land there exists the Vedic principle of Varnashram Dharma, which divides society into four Varnas and four Ashramas. Furthermore, Narad Muni's opinion is that even if there is some temporary disturbance in the execution of Varnashram Dharma principles, they can be revived at any moment. The effect of adhering to the institution of Varnashram is gradual elevation to the spiritual platform and liberation from material bondage. By following the principles of Varnashram Dharma, one gets the opportunity to associate with devotees. Such association gradually awakens one's dormant propensity to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead and frees one from all the basic principles of sinful life. One then gets the opportunity to offer unalloyed devotional service to the Supreme Lord Vasudev. Because this opportunity, the inhabitants of Bharat Varsh are praised even in the heavenly planets. Even in the topmost planet of this universe, Brahmaloka, 
The position of Bharat Varsh is discussed with great relish. All the conditioned living entities are evolving within the universe in different planets and different species of life. Thus one may be elevated to Brahma Loka, but then one must again descend to earth. As confirmed in Srimad Bhagavad Gita, A Brahma Bhuvana Loka Punar A Bhagavina Arjuna. If those who live in Bharat Varsh rigidly follow the principles of Varanashram Dharma and develop their dormant Krishna consciousness, they need not return to this material world after death. Any place where one cannot hear about the Supreme Personality of Godhead from realized souls, even if it be Brahma Loka, is not very congenial to the living entity. If one who has not if one who has taken birth in the land of Bharat Varsh as a human being does not take advantage of the opportunity for spiritual elevation, his position is certainly most miserable. In the land known as Bharat Varsh, even if one is a Sarvakama Bhakta, a devotee seeking the fulfillment of some material desire, he is freed from all material desires by his association with devotees and ultimately he becomes a pure devotee and returns home back to Godhead without difficulty. At the end of this chapter, Sri Sukadev Goswami describes to Maharaj Parikshit the eight sub-islands within the island of Jambu Dweep. <coughs> so just before I read the verse, just to give a little um, context. The Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, just like the Bhagavad Gita, contains five topics, isn't it? Uh, the, uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam contains ten topics. Atra sarga visargascha sthanam poshanamutaya manvantare shanukatha nirodha mukvir ashraya There are ten topics in the Bhagavatam. Different commentators say different things. Some say that all the topics are in all the cantos. And some commentators say that each canto contains a specific emphasis of a certain topic. So generally what's mentioned is that the fifth canto, does anyone know which topic the fifth canto is dealing with? Stanam. Stanam means literally a place where you stay. And if you think of many English words which begin with st, stop, stay, stationary, stand, um, these are all words which indicate staying in a certain place. So stana means uh, where you stay, the place. And where are we all staying? We're all staying in the material world. And so it said that the fifth canto is focusing on uh, the planetary systems. So here we have a whole description of the planetary systems which make up the material world. So just to give you a very, very quick summary of the Vedic structure of the universe, very quickly. There are two, two aspects which are described in Vedic cosmology. One is the vertical um, structure of the universe and then there is also a description of the horizontal structure of the universe I'll explain what I mean in the material world how many planetary systems are there? how many levels of planetary system? 14, yes so there are 14 levels of planetary system so the first aspect of Vedic cosmology deals with this vertical the highest planets are the upper planetary systems, Satyaloka, Tapaloka, Janaloka, Maharloka. These are called the upper planetary systems, the highest planets in the material world. Then just below the upper planetary system, then you have Svarga. Svarga means what? The heavenly planets. The topmost um, of Svarga is actually Dhruvaloka, the pole star. But then you have basically the Svarga planets, the heavenly planets. For example, the moon is a, like a heavenly planet, Chandraloka, like that. 
Then under the heavenly planets or Svarga, you have what you call Bhuvar Loka. That's where, you know, you have uh, other planets, including the Bhumandala. So Bhumandala is like a disk. So if you imagine the whole planetary system is like an egg, isn't it? It's like a Brahmanda. So right in the middle of the 14 planetary systems is Bhumandala. It's called the Earth disk. Okay? Mm -hmm. And this disk basically divides the seven upper and the seven lower. Okay? So Bhumandala. And then underneath Bhumandala, you have something called Bila Svarga. Bila Svarga means subterranean heavenly planets. So they are below the earthly planets, but they are like heavenly planets, even though they're in the lower planets. Um, where the demons, the daityas and others enjoy. And then right at the bottom of the material world, you have Narak, which means the hellish planets. That one is coming. It's like a horror movie. It's uh, heavy. So this is the vertical structure of the universe. In our minds, we think of it vertically, like higher and lower, but it's not exactly like that, because in the universe, the universe is functioning on different dimensions. So it's not that if you look up, then all the heavenly planets are up, and if you look down, all the hellish planets are down. It's not exactly like that. But because we need to have some image in our mind, it's, it's said like that. So that's the vertical structure of the universe. And then you have the horizontal structure of the universe. And where does the horizontal structure? That is described in the Bhagavatam in these chapters when we are talking about Bhumandala. So now let's talk about Bhumandala, because all of us are on Bhumandala. So if you imagine a disk, right in the centre of that disk is Sumeru, Mount Sumeru. Have you heard Mount Sumeru? Yeah. Now if you imagine a mount, around Mount Sumeru, there are different concentric circles, seven of them. And these seven circles which are divided by different oceans are known as the seven islands on Bhumandala. And one of those, the centermost island closest to Mount Sumeru is known as Jambudweep. Okay, so you imagine a circle like this, a circle. In the middle is Sumeru and around it there are different islands which are concentric circles separated by an ocean so Jambudweep is the ocean is the island right in the middle Sumeru is like this and around Jambudweep is an ocean of what kind of water salt water okay. every ocean is of a different nature so now we are on Jambudweep so now there are seven islands. We are on the island or the dvipa called Jambudweep. And Jambudweep is divided into seven varshas. Sorry, nine varshas. So there are nine regions in Jambudweep. Sorry, it was a little technical, but it's good to know. And on different varshas, different things are going on. And which Varsha are we on? Bharat Varsh, yes. We are on Bharat Varsh, which is right at the edge of Jambudweep. And there is still debate amongst the Vedic cosmologists as to what does the earth actually, what is actually the earth. But the most common opinion is that the earth is a globe which is basically floating above Bharat Varsh. That, that's where we are. And uh, Bharat Varsh on the, on the uh, plain of Jambudweep is then also further divided into uh, nine khandas. So that's basically where we are. So we are on the Bhumandala, which is right in the center of the universe, middle of the universe. On the Bhumandala, we are in Jambudweep, which is the innermost island. On Jambudweep, we're in the region or the Varsha called Bharat Varsh. And that's basically where we are. And the Bhagavatam is saying that 
Bharat Varish is actually the best place to be. That's good news. Uh, we are in the best place because in Bharat Varish there is Varnashram Dharma and there is access to uh, the Vedic teachings by which we can understand the goal of life. And so Bharat Varish is glorified. Um, Brahmande Brahmite, oh, no, sorry, what is that verse? Um, Manusha Janama Jas, Janma Sarataka Karikar, Bharata Bhumite. Hoilo manusha janama jar, janma sarataka kadikar, bara upakar. So if you take birth in Bharat, sometimes people say this refers to India, of course we know, but at one point this whole universe was Bharat. So in one sense everyone is taking birth in Bharat. And Bharata bhumite hoilo manusha janama jar, if you take a human form of life in Bharat Varsh, then you're very fortunate. Janma Sarataka, because you can make your life perfect, Bada um, Upakar, and you can help many other people. So we are on the uh, Bharat Varsh. Yeah. Just before I go on, does anyone have any questions on that? Does it make sense? It's a little technical. Yes. And these other planets, uh, like we are on this Earth, and there are other planets like Moon or Yes. Also so where are the, the, the like Venus, Mercury, yeah. all of those? And they are also in yeah. No, they are considered to be in the Swarga. Swarga, above Bhumandala. So for example, Mercury, Venus, all these, that Western cosmology often talks about, these are, these are uh, considered to be in the Swarga. Therefore, Srila Prabhupada questioned whether they actually went to the moon. Because uh, Svarga means you can't go there by physical arrangement. Svarga requires one to have uh, greater credit to go there. Uh, and of course, according to our conception, the moon is further away from the earth than the sun. So... But then, of course, on the moon, Srila Prabhupada said different things. Sometimes he said they didn't go anywhere. It was just a complete, you know, hoax. Sometimes he said they went, but they didn't go. They went to Rahu, which is another planet. Sometimes Srila Prabhupada said they went, but they could not access the actual reality of the moon because they said there's no life there. So that can't be true. So even if they did go to the moon, they couldn't actually perceive the actual reality of the moon because there are different dimensions. Like you could come to this building, but you may not understand the totality of the building because there are four floors. So if you come to this building and just go to the ground floor and then you say, yes, I, I saw the whole building. No, you didn't. You only saw the ground floor, but you did go to the building. But you didn't see the whole building because you only had access to the ground floor. So similarly, even if they did go to the moon, they may not have seen the totality of the moon because they don't have the qualification to perceive that dimension. So, like that. Yes. Yeah, the influence is a subtle influence. It's not dependent on proximity or distance or anything like that. Basically, what happens is when you're born, there are certain astrological... Um, yeah, there's a chart and there are certain astrological positions. So what it is, like say for example, when you go to the hospital, then say they do something like an MRI scan, a scan of your body, then there's a report. And that report basically says everything that's going on in your body. So if you think of an astrological chart, it's something like that. Basically, according to when you were born, where you were born, and the details surrounding your birth, the planets are in a certain position, and what they're indicating is how your karma will play out in this life. That's why through your chart, they can tell you many, many karmic, uh, things that you will deal with in this life um, and yes the planets are influencing us in different ways um, 
on a subtle level yeah so yeah so these things are there so yeah astrology is there and uh, sometimes devotees may do their astrology of course we have to keep it keep it in perspective because Krishna consciousness has a greater power than any subtle material power or any subtle material influence but yes the planets are influencing us what to speak of planets even if you say for example night time don't you see how darkness affects people when are more sinful activities done in the night time or the daytime Even if you go to Sweden, if you go to the northernmost part of Sweden, then in the winter, they have 23 hours of darkness. And in summer, they have 23 hours of light. But they did a, they did a statistics and they found that in the winter time, in those parts of the world where there's so much darkness, there are higher suicide rates. Because this is the subtle influence that our environment can have on us. So in the same way, yes, there are planets, there are different things like this, and they are affecting our consciousness. But for one who is elevated in spiritual consciousness, they become more and more uh, immune to this. They're not so affected in the same way. Therefore, Prabhupada said, just surrender to Krishna, he can kick out thousands of Rahu planets. Okay. Okay. So uh, I yes. I just heard that actually we cannot uh, call planets uh, planets who are influencing us. They are called grahas, which means yeah, yeah. conquer somebody who conquer us. So yeah. they are not only just uh, being there, but they are conquering our consciousness, trying to conquer. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Trying to conquer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, in that way, definitely. But as mentioned, so and that's very true. And as mentioned, that uh, um, through Krishna consciousness, through like Krishna says, um, what does Krishna say there? Devi uh, here, Shibuna Mai, Mama Maya, Duratya, Mameva Ye, Prabhadyante, Maya Metan, Tarantite. It's very difficult. The influence of this material nature is very difficult to overcome. But one who has surrendered unto me, Taranti means to cross, like avatar means to cross down. So Taranti means to cross beyond. You can go beyond Maya, freed from that influence. Thank you. Okay, so these uh, verses are in uh, prose. They are not uh, verses to be chanted. So I'll just read it and then we'll read the English and see where we go. Shri Sukho Vacha Kim Purushe Varshe Bhagavatanam Adipurusham Lakshmana Grajam Sita Bhiramam Ramam Tacharana Sanikarsha Bhirata Padama Bhagavato Hanuman Saha Kim Purushe Ravirata Bhakti Rupashte uh, okay, so I'll do the English translation. Srila Sukadev Goswami said, My dear King, in Kim Purusha Varsh, the great devotee Hanuman is always engaged with the inhabitants of that land in devotional service to Lord Ramachandra, the elder brother of Lakshman and dear husband of Sita Devi. So just so you know, uh, so we have, remember I was saying there's Jambu Dweep, and in Jambu Dweep, how many Varshas are there? Nine. There's nine. So one of the Varshas is known as Bharat Varsh, right on the edge. And the next Varsh, straight after Bharat Varsh, is known as Kim Purusha Varsh. And this is uh, where the great devotee Hanuman is engaged in devotional service to Lord Ramachandra. Okay, so then uh, text number two is no purple. Arsti Sanena Sahagandar Ved 
अनुगीयमानं परमकल्याणीं भ्रातृ भगवत कथां समुपश्रृणोती स्वयं चेदं गयंती A host of Gandharvas is always engaged in chanting the glories of Lord Ramachandra. That chanting is always extremely auspicious. Hanumanji and Aristasena, the chief person in the Kim Purusha Varsh, constantly hear those glories with complete attention. Hanuman chants the following mantras. Purple. In the Puranas, there are two different opinions concerning Lord Ramachandra. In the Lagu Bhagavatamrita 534 to 36, this is confirmed in the description of the incarnation of Manu. Vasudevadi Rupanam Avatara Prakirtita Vishnu Dharma Rama Lakshmana Dya Kramadami Padme tu Ramo Bhagavan Narayana Itirata Sheshas Chakram Chashankascha Kramatshur Lakshmana Daya Madhyadeshe Stita Yodhya Puresya Vasati Shmrita Maha Vaikunthalo Kecha Raghavendra Syakirtita The Vishnu Dhamautara describes that Lord Ramachandra and his brothers Lakshman, Bharat and Shatrugna are incarnations of Vasudev, Shankarshan, Pradyumna and Aniruddha respectively. <coughs> the Padma Purana however says that Lord Ramachandra is an incarnation of Narayan and that the other three brothers are incarnations of Shesha, Chakra and Shankar. Therefore, Sri Bhagavad Vidya Bhusan has concluded Dadidam Kalpa Bhedaneva Sambhavyam. In other words, these opinions are not contradictory. In some millenniums, Lord Ramachandra and his brothers appear as incarnations of Vasudev, Shankarshan, Pradyumna, and Aniruddha. And in other millenniums, they appear as incarnations of Narayana, Shesha, Chakra, and Shankar. The residence of Lord Ramachandra on this planet is Ayodhya. Ayodhya city is still existing in the district of Hyderabad, which is situated on the northern side of Uttar Pradesh. Srila Prabhupada Ki Omagyanati Mirandha Sikyananjana Shalakaya Chakshuran Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakada Mayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalan Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha <coughs> Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ravanathan Vitam Dam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakantitamscha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dinabandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostite Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priya Vanchakalbataru Bhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhya Evacha Patitana Bhavane Bhyo Vishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunitya Nanda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasudhi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare <coughs> So here uh, we're coming across something that often happens in scripture. Often what happens in scripture is there seems to be contradictory statements. This happens sometimes. So here the contradiction is that in one scripture is said that Ram 
and his brothers are incarnations of the Chaturvyuha. Jai Shishibite Parangadarmitai. So one scripture says that they are incarnations of the Chaturvyuha, and another scripture seems to be saying that they are incarnations of Shesha, Chakra, and Shankar. So naturally this is confusing because we think one has to be right and that means if one is right then what does it mean about the other one is wrong. But how can scripture be wrong? Therefore this often happens in Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. Sometimes there may be statements that are said that seem to be contradictory. Like for example can you think of a statement, two statements in the Bhagavad Gita that may seem to be a contradiction? Can you think of anything like that? Yes? Can you give us an example? Arjuna? Okay, what's the contradiction? Yeah, okay. So sometimes it seems to say that Arjun is a great Vaishnav, even Srila Prabhupada says he's greatly soft-hearted, which means he's, you know, uh, a sign of a great Vaishnav. And then on the other hand, Krishna is saying, you are an Arya, you are not an Aryan, uh, you should arise, give up your weakness of heart. So it seems to be a contradiction. Good. Something else? In the fourth chapter, what does Krishna say? Paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chaduskritam dharma sanstapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. When Krishna says dharma sanstapanarthaya, what is he saying? I come to this world to establish what? What does Krishna come here in this world to establish? Dharma. Religion. Yeah. But then what does Krishna say in the 18th chapter? Sarva dharman parityajya. Isn't that a contradiction? On one hand, Krishna is saying, I come to establish dharma. But then at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, he says, give up all dharma. Someone may say that sounds like a contradiction. Yes, yes. So, yeah, yeah, I'm going to come to that in a minute. I'm just, I'm just proposing what some people may argue. <laughs> well, for example, can you, think two, can you think of two statements someone may give of Srila Prabhupada saying that this seems to be a contradiction? Of course, we know Srila Prabhupada is never contradictory, but someone may feel this is a contradiction. Yes. Okay, sometimes we may say, Srila Prabhupada may say, yes, you can go to the spiritual world in a moment. Or sometimes he may make a statement that it takes many, many lives to go. Uh, many, many, uh, yeah, so that may seem like a contradiction. Yes, Maharaj? Let me keep. Sometimes, for example, Srila Prabhupada may say, Vaishnavas have nothing to do with Varnashram Dharma. He may make a statement like that. But then later on, he may say, Varnashram Dharma is essential within our movement. It's essential for progressive human civilization. So someone may feel, what if this is a contradiction? But actually, in the words of Shastra, in the words of Guru, and in the words of a saintly person, there can never be any contradiction. All that it requires is that one understand the deeper reason why there seems to be a difference. If one understands the desha, kala and patra, which means the time, place and circumstance, then when one understands the context behind what is being said, then one will see that there is no contradiction. Like Maharaj has given us the understanding that when Krishna says sarva dharman paritya ja, what he's referring to is give up all lower dharmas. 
and just accept Sanatan Dharma, which is to surrender to Krishna. And when Krishna is saying Dharma Sansta, he is coming to establish the ultimate Sanatan Dharma. So there's no contradiction. But one must understand it in a deeper level. If one doesn't understand it in a deeper level, then they will be confused and they will see some disunity. So here, it seems that two different things are being said about Ram's origin. That uh, Ram is originating from the Chaturvyuha, and then another statement is saying that Ram is originating um, from Shesha, Chakra, and Shankar. So, how does Baladev Vidya Bhusan in the purport, Srila Prabhupada mentions, how does he resolve the difference? Does anyone remember? Prabhupada said in the purport how he resolves the seeming difference between these two statements. Balada Vidya Bhusan basically says, Kalpa Bheda. What does Kalpa Bheda mean? In different millenniums, the Lord appears in different ways. So Kalpa Bheda means difference. And Kalpa Bheda means the difference of how things happen in different millenniums. So when uh, one Shastra says Ram came from here and another Shastra says Ram came from here, they can both be true because in different Kalpas or different millenniums, Ram appears in different ways. Sometimes you may hear a, a Shastric story that appears to be told differently. So someone may say, this is a mistake. Like in this book it says this happened. In this book it says this happened. That means there's a mistake. No. Because in different kalpas, the same pastime may happen in a different way. Did you know, how did Pariksha uh, leave his body at the end of the Bhagavatam? Does anyone remember? At the end of the seven days, how did Pariksha leave his body? Anyone know? Yeah. He burnt? He burnt? Is that what we read in Bhagavatam? In Bhagavatam we hear that he was bitten by the snake bird, Taksha. Remember? He was cursed. But if you read, for example, Brihat Bhagavatamrita, other literatures, the disappearance of Pariksha is described in a different way. The Bhagavatam says he went to the uh, bank of the Ganga Yamuna sometimes it said and there he was bitten but in other Shastras it said that he was in a tower and he left his body in the tower so how can it be different but it can be different because Kalpa Beda that means in different time frames the same thing can happen in different ways and therefore Shastra and the instructions of Guru are very, very complicated. Yeah. Complicated. We can say they have many uh, angles to them. And oftentimes what happens in our movement is that there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of argument because people pick up one quote or one side of the story and then only teach that and say everyone else is wrong. But there can be many ways to see different uh, topics of Shastra. And therefore, uh, Vaishnavas study the Shastra, the Guru Sadhu Shastra, from all angles of vision, so that they can uh, get the full understanding. This is known as Samanvaya. Yeah. The first aphorism of Vedanta Sutra, does anyone remember what is the first aphorism of Vedanta Sutra? Yes, Atato Brahma Jigyasa. Now you have the human form of body. Inquire about the absolute truth. Does anyone know what the second sutra of Vedanta is? Janma Yasha Yataha. Who is the absolute truth? The one from whom everything comes. The third uh, sutra of Vedanta, Shastra Yonitvat. If you want to understand who is the absolute truth, then you have to go where? To Shastra. But the fourth sutra of Vedanta is Tattu Samanvayat. 
which means that Shastra may give many, many different statements and you have to be able to harmonize and understand all of those statements together because otherwise you may get confused. And so this is why Srila Prabhupada wanted us to have a Bhagavatam class. This is why Srila Prabhupada wanted the devotees to study the books and discuss them because there are many, many uh, different perspectives that need to be understood and need to be balanced uh, in a mature way. Otherwise, we will uh, misunderstand uh, what is being said. Okay, so let me stop there and see uh, if anyone has any questions. Yes. I have a question. Why are you making it nine or some sort? No, ten. Ten rounds. Um, what to say? What is a perception? So we, how we possess, perceive the knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and there is one is also contradictions and then different kinds. But the first three, I think you know, it is the most important, it is to, uh, to get to the possibility to perceive Chandra Brahman, to perceive the um, sound vibration. Yeah, uh, so the sphere of sound vibration coming from the pure uh, source. Yes. yes, and if there are so many, <coughs> so many so called contradictions and different things, how to. <coughs> how to. Understand, yeah. So in Tattva Sandarbha, Tattva means truth. So Jiva Goswami writes the Tattva Sandarbha. And in the Tattva Sandarbha, he is basically uh, explaining how do you understand truth. This is in philosophy known as epistemology. What is your method of gaining knowledge? So the way he begins Tattva Sandarbha is he begins by saying there are three I mean, he says in a more complicated way, but we can say there are three main sources of knowledge. Pratyaksha, which means that which you gain through your mind and senses. Anuman, which means that which you, knowledge which you gain by inference or by logical analysis. And then he says the third way is Shabda, which means that which you gain by testimony from a higher source. And so then Jiva Goswami then goes on to say, uh, which source should you hear from? So then he makes the point that you shouldn't hear from a material source because a material source has four defects. Commit mistakes, subject to illusion, imperfect senses, cheating. He says, therefore, you should go to a spiritual source. And he says, if you want to go to a spiritual source, then the best source to go to is the Vedic scripture. But then he says there are many scriptures in the Vedas, so which one should you go to? So then what he does is he establishes that the Puranas are the best place to go. Because Purana doesn't just mean old, but Purana means that which makes everything Purna or perfect. And he says therefore, if you want to understand the essence of the Vedas, you should go to the Puranas. But then he says there are 18 Puranas, so which one should you go to? So he says, well, they are in three divisions, Puranas in ignorance, passion and goodness. So he said, go to the Puranas in goodness, they are higher. Then he says, okay, but that's still six of those Puranas, which should we go to? And then he establishes, Srimad Bhagavatam Ishite, Sarve Vedanta Saram Hi, Srimad Bhagavatam Ishite. Of all the Vedanta, Bhagavatam is considered the Amala. Purana, which means no contamination. So basically, like this in Tattva Sandarbha, Jiva Goswami basically says, if you want to know truth, then you have to go to Bhagavatam, because this is pure spiritual sound vibration. But even Bhagavatam, you cannot understand book Bhagavat without person Bhagavat. Therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu tells in Jagannath Puri, Jaha Bhagavata Pada Vaishna Vedastane Ekanta Ashraya Kore Chaitanya Charane. If you want to understand Bhagavatam, then you have to sit at the feet of someone who knows Bhagavatam and you have to hear from them. Satam Prasangan Mamavirya Samvedo Bhavanti Ritkarna Rasayana Katha. 
talks of Bhagavatam have to go on in the assembly of the serious and sincere practitioners of Bhagavatam and then you will understand. So Shastra is the place in which we get the pure sound vibration but Shastra has to be received through a teacher of Shastra who is living the Shastra. Therefore what does Krishna tell Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita? Tadvidi pranipatena pariprasnena sevaya You have to go to a teacher and number one be humble. Then number two pariprasna ask questions. And then number three sevaya render service. And by doing those three things the knowledge will be given to you. Yasya deve para bhakti yatha deve tatha guru just like we have faith in Krishna, we should also develop simultaneous faith in the Guru or the one teaching Bhagavatam. Because if you have faith in both, um, then this Upanishadic verse says, all the imports of Vedic knowledge will be awakened within your heart. So therefore, yes, the pure sound vibration is Shastra. The essence of all Shastra is Bhagavatam. And you have to hear Bhagavatam from someone who is a living Bhagavatam. And therefore we're hearing from Srila Prabhupada because he's delivering to us. He's the ambassador of the Bhagavatam. Is that okay? Thank you. Anyone else would like to ask any question or any clarification? How long does class go on to? It's about finished now. Oh, no. Okay. Anyone has any question they would like to ask? Or... Yes. Just to look at, in the beginning, when you were explaining mm -hmm. also a little bit about the structure of the universe, mm -hmm. you said that in order for us to have some image, to understand there's some division of higher, lower, and lower planets, we have to see you know, how are they more accurately situated in this thing. So you must be used to have it on higher, lower, and lower. Yeah, when we say higher, lower, you see, we're always looking at everything in terms of physical. We're only ever seeing things from physical dimension. You see, like, I'll give you an example. The position, <coughs> if I say the, the clock is on the top of the wall, then clearly that means that the clock is high physically but then if I say uh, uh, I don't know um, Maharaj is in the highest position is that a physical position? no but he's in the highest position of Varanashra so that's not a physical position but it's still higher you see because that's a subtle position. So there's physical position and there's subtle position. So whenever we think of something as higher and we're looking at the planets, we generally always think of it, everything that's higher is physically higher, higher. But it's not like that. Like in the, um, in the universe, there are different dimensions of reality. And those different dimensions of reality are higher, not necessarily because they're physically higher, but because they're in a, a different dimension of existence. So that's why decoding, uh, that's why decoding Vedic cosmology is very, very difficult. And even the devotees don't necessarily all have the same opinions on it. Because how much of it do you take literally and how much of it do you take as more uh, a dimensional reality? These are all still somewhat discussions that are going on. And so, um, so yeah, it's not like uh, everything that's up is higher when we look up. But it's higher in a different dimension. So these are the mysteries of the sacred universe. <laughs> Very difficult to understand. Yes. They're also higher and lower. Yeah. And higher, it, and yeah. higher are the Brahman 
Australia. Yeah, yeah. We see like we the, uh, that drawing we see of the planetary systems. Yes, because we have to depict it. We have to show it somehow. But uh, when we're drawing something, it's not necessary. Like say, for example, when you see the picture of Nishingadev and Prahlad. Uh, sorry, uh, Hiranyakashipu and uh, yeah, Nishingadev, Pallad and Hiranyakashipu. If you look at the physical sizes of what their bodies were meant to be, you, you wouldn't really be able to draw <laughs> draw them in one picture because it's so too big. So therefore, in our art, we sometimes depict things in a certain way that may not be literal, but gives you a sense of. Um, a sense of what uh, what was going on so therefore art and how we depict something visually may not necessarily be like the literal way like I'll give you another example have you seen you, of course you've seen the picture of Varahadev bringing the earth planet out now many Vedic cosmologists say that this You've seen the one I'm talking about, right? When the Earth planet is on the Varaha Dev's uh, uh, like that. Now the question is, is Varaha Dev just bringing the Bhugola, the Earth planet, or is he bringing the Bhu Mandala? So if you look at some ancient paintings of Varaha Dev, on his uh, nose is not a globe, it's a disc. Because when he's saving the Bhu Mandala, it's the whole disk, not just the earth planet as we see it. So again, these are, these are myst mysterious things, how to depict um, these things of the spiritual world, or not even the spiritual, or even material phenomena which are beyond our experience. So yeah, we must understand um, sometimes there are limitations of... Um, Yes. But because of the solar we also live. Yeah, so that we're yeah, we have a very small, our perception is very, very small. Therefore, Prabhupada said, when they were reading the fifth canto, Prabhupada said, What will you understand with your pea sized brain? We're very small. Like, how we will understand, like, we grew up in one small city or. Like Prabhupada told to Krishna Maharaj, there are. The material world is only one quarter of the spiritual world and in the material world there are many many uh, universes and in the, every universe there are many many planets and out of those many many planets we're on one planet in which there are many many continents and of the different continents there are many many countries and in that country one country there are many many cities and in one city there are many many streets and in one street there are many many buildings and in that one there may be one building on which there are many floors and on one floor there are many rooms and in one room there are many people and in that one of those many people there is one person and he is thinking I'm very big how we will understand we're so small so here we are trying to approach, uh, we're trying to approach cosmic reality and understand it, you know, in a half an hour class, is beyond us. But we are trying and by reading the words of the Bhagavatam, ultimately we're becoming purified and uh, we're realizing Krishna is very, very great. I'm very, very small. That's the ultimate, we can say the ultimate, one of the ultimate purposes of having cosmology in the Bhagavatam is not just to give faith and not just to give a scientific explanation, of course, but also it's just meant for us to read it and for us to realize, oh my God, actually I'm very small. I'm very insignificant. Uh, maybe, just maybe I should surrender and, uh, and worship Krishna because he's much greater. Yes, How important is it actually um, to understand all this in detail for the most part? 
<laughs> well, Krishna says, Gyanavan uh, mam prapadyade. If you surrender, then you you are the most intelligent. You're the most uh, most learned. Krishna says so. If it's someone's service that they have to be able to explain these things and respond to the scientific world, then they have to make a detailed study of these things. So they will study it very, very deeply. Another person, they may just have many, many doubts. And for them, it's necessary to read these things in order to understand and grasp and remove their doubts so that they can practice Krishna consciousness. So for them it may be necessary. And for other devotees, it may not be as necessary. They're just more content with practicing spiritual life and they are, uh, they are satisfied and happy with the explanations they've been given. So for them, they should still read it, but they may not go into depth. So everyone's different. Everyone has a different um, nature and everyone has a different service so everyone will go to different levels of depth so we just ask ourselves how much we are interested and how much we need to and if we don't have so much inclination or interest and if we don't have a service then we read it we try to grasp it in the association of devotees and then we continue reading on other parts of the Bhagavatam which inspire us to surrender. That's what I would say. Yes. In this regard, I once had a funny little episode. Krishna Shesha Maharaj was giving an overview over the Bhagavatam. <laughs> and I was sitting there with pen and paper, looking at it, and I couldn't understand anything. I, I didn't find anything to write. <laughs> So then afterwards I went to Maharaj and I said, Maharaj, I thought I have some little taste for the Bhagavatam, but I couldn't understand anything. And then he was just laughing and saying, because it's all not important, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was greatly relieved. <laughs> Sometimes we can understand also all of these things are given in the Bhagavatam just to convince us that we won't be able to understand. <laughs> it's beyond us. But, um, yeah. but, but it's nice to know that there are devotees in the movement who are able to analyze it and then present it to the world in very powerful ways. So that's a great. Srila Prabhupada was able to give it to us for those who have that capacity. So that's a great thing. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, one yes. more little thing which is a little different. You were reading the summary before. Yes, right? yes. And if I remember correctly, there was one statement which was a little provocative there. Yes. Part, where he said something that all opulence and higher education is actually... Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, can you read that again, <laughs> I that. Yeah, yeah, that was. One should surrender fully to the Lord. This is the end of the first paragraph. One should surrender fully to the Lord, forgetting one's so-called material happiness, opulence and education, which are not at all useful for pleasing the Lord. <laughs> And then in other places we see that the same Srila Prabhupada who is writing this established Bhaktivedanta Institute and told the devotees who had an education in science that they should preach about Krishna uh, through their scientific language and cut atheism at the root. Um, I would again say it's one of those things that seems a contradiction but like you know in English sometimes you have different things which seem like a contradiction which are both true like for example if I say the pen is mightier than the sword but then I could also say actions speak louder than words and both statements are true although they seem like a contradiction 
Or we could say, birds of a feather flock together, which is true. But we could also say, opposites attract, which is also true, which seem a contradiction. So sometimes Srila Prabhupada would say, Janme Shwarya, Shruta Shri Bir, your beauty, your um, knowledge, all of these things are useless, throw them out, they won't help in understanding the Lord, which is true. Because ultimately, Bhakti Ma may be Janati only by devotion. Yet we also um, see that, yes, it can be useful um, if used in service um, of the Lord. Um, so, yes. Would you guess, like to say anything on that? Yeah. I guess that so often you need pride. Yeah, that's pride, the that's the point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All of these things lead to pride when one has good birth, good education, beauty. And when there's pride, then there's no room for humility. And if there's no humility, there's no love. So therefore, uh, we have to become a kinchana gochara, as uh, Queen Kunti says, not at all intoxicated by any of these things. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. Very nice. Okay, so... Unless there's any final questions or comments. Uh, Maharaj, any last there was comments? Another discussion on the GDC and all that. And we were planning the, the hydrogen. Oh, the planetarium. The planetarium. Yeah. yeah. And also, they, they actually were sent to Bodhi to, enter, to interview people who were kind of specialized in these kind of. Oh, in creating that like universal movies. diagrams, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, even our devotee scientists don't um, all hold exactly the same perspective on um, the Bhagavatam's description. So, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, Sadaputta's book, Sacred Universe, is. Uh, he describes all of these things, Jambudvip, the Bhumandala and others. He depicts it in diagrams and other things and then shows like uh, how many of these things uh, are in line with many of the things that modern um, astronomers and you know scientists would say. Astronomer. 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 Famous, famous guy. I never, I never heard about him again. Maybe he left his body or something. And, and he appreciated. And, and uh, he came to the conclusion. He, he, he came to the conclusion that actually there's no more detail or deep explanation about mm -hmm. the concept of the universe than in the Vedas. Wow. Yeah, it's all there. We are so fortunate to be given. And I'll just say one final thing on this. We often read this and it sounds like, my God, this is extraordinary. This is like too, like beyond my mind. But it's amazing that in the world, the explanations that they give you of the origins of the universe, they're just as extraordinary. They're just as like beyond our conception. You know, that everything was concentrated at one point in time and at a superheated temperature and then it all, you know, there was a huge explosion and from that explosion, you know, all these things. But because we've been taught that from day one, there's somehow it becomes easier for people to accept it. But if you look at it stepping back, that is just you have to put as just as much faith in that as you have to put in this there's no extra faith required here uh, more than that so we should just understand that 
you know, we are so conditioned by an educational system that allows us or not allows us but you know trains us to put faith in certain things very easily and to be very skeptical about other things very easily um, when actually you know um, this doesn't require any more faith than what already people are putting into the theories of the world that explain consciousness the universe and so on Thank you so much, Kankaraj Shimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Shilaprabhupada Ki Jai.